Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So many, many months ago, I got an email from someone marketing Grazi Box Wines. I had seen their ads on Facebook for a while and I still do. They're part of what I consider a disturbing trend to present wine in a more healthy way using buzzwords and implying that most wines are not like their wines when you get into the stats of the wines. I agreed to do a review and the PR firm had, sent the, had the wines sent to me. I did email the PR firm for more information about the winery and wines, but never got a reply. In July, I eventually started reviewing most of the sample wines sent to me, well, since the end of last year. When I got to the Grazi wines, uh, I recorded my scripted intro, like I'm doing now. After that, I discovered that both boxes were oxidized. Not a little bit, but a lot. I realized that I had had the boxes for too long. I had discussed this with someone associated with another box wine company. The same one from Freestyle Friday episode a week or two ago, where I interviewed Jake Whitman from Really Good Boxed Wine. In that episode, you'll note that a box wine should be good for up to a year after the wine is put into the plastic bag or the box, and then about six weeks once you break the seal. While I hadn't had these boxes for a year, the fact that they were severely oxidized most likely meant that these boxes had been filled several months before I had received them. So what's the wine critic to do? Well, the only ethical thing to do was to purchase replacement boxes. So that's what I did. Instead of contacting the PR person to ask for more free wine, I decided that I needed to shell out the money to replace them. During the couple months in between, I evaluated my initial intro to that episode. I actually deleted it immediately since I knew I couldn't really use it. But I had decided that maybe I was a little too harsh on Grazi, or maybe not. I used my interview with Jake to get a better feel for box wines in general, Plus, both Jake and my other contact, Amy, had good things to say about Grazi despite my concerns. So let's get into the good and bad about these box wines. All right, what first put them on my radar was their ads and social media, especially highlighting being low sugar wine. Let's set the record straight. Wine is a low sugar beverage as compared to things like dessert or sweet wines, sodas, fruit juice, even something like milk. In general, a wine that is considered a dry table wine will have 10 grams per liter of residual sugar, or RS, or less. All right, so, and that's debatable, but the EU requires a wine to be 4 grams per liter or less, except for some specific wines that have high acidity. In this case, that'll be around 6 or 9 grams per liter of RS. In the case of sparkling wines, 12 grams per liter is considered the maximum RS for a brute or dry sparkling wine. All right, so I'm gonna put up a chart here of some beverages that have more sugar than a dry table wine. All right, so Muscat d'Asti is a dessert wine that has 100 grams per liter or more. Spätlese Riesling is usually around 50 grams per liter or more. Your fruit juice, so Tropicana Original No Pulp Orange Juice is listed at 93 grams per liter. Milk, uh, 50 grams per liter. This is a Borden, uh, Borden Dairy 2% reduced fat milk. Coca-Cola, it's 110 grams per liter from the Coca-Cola company. And then an EU dry wine is up to four grams per liter. Now the sources for all these, uh, in the, sources for all these are in the description along with some other uh, wines I'm about to talk to you about. Wines outside the EU are more likely to push their R's closer to 10 grams per liter and still be called dry. Even so, Many wines comply with the EU's dry wine definition in order to stay compliant if it is going to be sold in the EU as a dry table wine. Otherwise, it needs to carry some kind of semi-sweet or sweeter or similar designation on the label. Now, that's not to say that wines like, say, Josh Sellers County Sauvignon, which is six grams per liter, or the Prisoner Wine Company Red Blend at eight grams per liter, or Camus Cabernet Sauvignon at 10 grams per liter, or Menage a Trois Silk Red Blend at 14 grams per liter, or Apothic Red at 15 grams per liter, or Mayomi uh, Pinot Noir at 17 grams per liter, and others 
aren't out there with higher RS in order to make the wine taste better. The RS is either naturally in there due to arresting fermentation or, more likely, the addition of grape must or inverted sugar after fermentation. But there are also wines like these. Joel got Cabernet Sauvignon at 4 grams per liter. Duckhorn Decoy Cabernet Sauvignon, also at 4 grams per liter. Louis M. Martini Sonoma County Cabernet Sauvignon, also 4 grams per liter. Silver Oak Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon at 2 grams per liter. Robert Mondavi Winery Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, 2 grams per liter. And Opus One at 2 grams per liter. And many of these are, I'd say, high volume production wines. Some would even consider these to be industrial wines, depending on your definition. The bottom line is that you could randomly pick a non-European wine off the shelf and still be in a dry style, as long as we define dry as 10 grams per liter or less of RS. Well, why? Well, depending on who you talk to, we can't detect sugary sweetness until we get to somewhere around 5 to 10 grams per liter. Lots of factors are involved, but once you get above 10 grams per liter of sugar in a wine, it will definitely start to taste sugary sweet and not just fruity sweet. FYI, like I said, I already got the links uh, to all these wines on the from the LCBO website uh, in the description. The LCBO is the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Now they test just about every single wine they sell to verify they comply with Canadian wine law and then publish the RS. As far as I know, Canada doesn't regulate wine RS, but the LCBO does publish it. The whole point of this is to show that wines at all price points can be low in sugar as well as elevated. We'll get to Grazi's stats in a minute. Okay, who is Grazi Wine? The website is short on details and long on marketing fluff. All right, back in December when I first looked them up, there was more information as to the people who started the wine and the backstory. It wasn't much, but now there's literally nothing. From the initial email from the PR firm, I found out that one of the founders is Aaron Moore, and he had, quote, has extensive experience throughout the three-tier industry, including managing the EJ Gallo portfolio, prior to launching his own direct-to-consumer wine brand with Grazi. He is extremely passionate in hand-selecting every blend during the harvest pro harvesting process and could speak in depth about the sustainability initiatives Grazi incorporates in both the vineyards and manufacturing process. All right, end quote. So as I mentioned earlier, I did email the PR firm for more information, but I declined to ask to talk with Aaron as I, was, I just wanted specific information and the questions I asked were a bit critical in tone. Anyway, great. Aaron is an industry person of some sort, but that doesn't really that doesn't really say that much. Let's be honest, people who have never made a wine in their life have gotten into the business and are personally making or hiring killer winemakers to make excellent wines. I mean, look at really good box wine. All right, Jake was nowhere from the industry. He came from somewhere else, but he decided he wanted to get into it. So basically, you don't have to be you don't have to have been an apprentice winemaker for 10 years or go to UC Davis to be able to make excellent wine. Now, don't get me wrong, it helps. It helps a lot. But there are plenty of knowledgeable people out there, you know, aka consultants, that will ensure your wines are good. Now, again, let me just say this. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to UC Davis or go to some university. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn about the chemistry. You're going to know way more about winemaking than somebody like me just coming along or somebody who has never studied wine at all. They just want to get into it and they have the funds to get into it. But those people are hiring the people who know that, right? They're just the money people and they're marketing people. Let's talk about the source of the wines. The website states that they source the wines from Washington State and they buy from many growers. And these growers have vineyards in five different AVAs. Cool, negotiate style wine. I'm totally down with that. Some of the best wines in the world are 100% purchased fruit. They also say the wines are made in Prosser, Washington. The boxes say, quote, cellared and bottled in Prosser, Washington. At least the new boxes do. My original boxes said they were cellared and bottled by Golden Hills in Morgan Hill, California, which when you looked it up, it pretty much is just a fake name. Um, it was hard for me to find an address for it. I mean, it's it's not a real winery. You know what I mean? It's like not you're, you're not going to go visit a tasting room, but it, is, it was an actual company. But now they moved everything to Washington, which honestly is a more sustainable approach. The new boxes don't specify a winery. It just says, you know, Prosser, Washington. So I guess that's legal as you only have to have an address. And that address apparently only needs to be a city and state, at least as far as TTB is concerned. For real. Well, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't email the, the TTB just to make sure. 
So this means that one of the 30 plus wineries in Prosser, Washington do the actual winemaking, and then the wines are quote, finished elsewhere in Prosser. All right, so again, I'm totally down with that. I'm not being funny about that. There are plenty of well-known wines where some of the same process is happening. And since Aaron handled Gallo's portfolio, not sure if he was, uh, you know, not sure if it was as a distributor or actually worked for Gallo, but anyway, he is probably very familiar with all the logistics on how to do this. Again, going back to the really good box wine, they, they actually have a winery where they do some of the winemaking and then they have other wineries make the stuff or they truly partner and they reveal who it is and they just finish it off. There's nothing wrong with this, okay? All right, so, but the box is a product of USA versus Washington or Columbia Valley. And that's just weird. According to the website, all the fruit comes from the Columbia Valley AVA. So why does it say product of USA? Uh, to me, this is honestly a huge red flag. Not that it's a negotiant wine, but that the website says the wines are Washington, but the label just says USA. I get that there are plenty of vanity or private labels out there. Hell, Total Wine specializes in what are known as DIs or direct imports. These are wines made by a legit winery, but are sold either to a restaurant or retail chain for a discount with a really non-existent winery name. Or a company like Grazi that doesn't actually own a winery, well, as far as I can tell. They figure out what wines they want to purchase, set up the packaging, and sell it. Let's look for a vintage. Well, okay, just trust me, there's none, okay? I'm very skeptical about this in general. It's not that every wine needs a vintage. Hell, some of the best wines in the world have no vintage, aka non-vintage champagne. I think I've made my point with that the best wines in the world phrase by now. Anyway, with that said, not having a vintage just means that you can control the supply of the wine. Since they don't mention any kind of aging, they can literally have a wine at the ready. I'm not saying that they do this at all, just that it's possible. That would change their that, that would change their text sheets on the website over time, but that's easy to change digitally versus changing stuff on a label. Now, let me say this. If it's still Columbia Valley AVA, that's, you don't have to get new label approvals every time you put out a new batch of wine. If you have different AVAs or you have a significant change in ABV and stuff like that, you might have to do that. All right, we'll get to the ABV in a second. All right, you know, you know who else switched to non-vintage? Mayomi. And that really reinforces my view that vintage doesn't matter to the vast majority of the wine drinking public. Now, people like me make it sound more important, but most people can't tell the difference and don't want it to be different. That's the key. They don't want it to taste different, but they make millions of cases of Mayomi. And in this case, these wines are presented as a daily drinker kind of wine. So vintage isn't as important in my opinion. My old email to the uh, PR person said that the website mentioned organically grown grapes, but I didn't see any certifications. I don't see anything about organics specifically in the site now, so they may have removed it or I was mistaken. In their FAQ, they do mention that the wines are sustainably made and pesticide free, so that's totally cool. That implies organic or bio farming. They also mentioned vegan and gluten free. Newsflash, why is gluten free? You may have seen a recent episode where I went into more detail about this. Okay, let's talk about a few things the website highlights. They talk about Mediterranean inspired, low sugar, bi direct, and better for the planet. All right, so first up, Mediterranean inspired, I got nothing there. They want the wine to be, quote, consumed as casually and regularly as the Romans do. 100% down with that. Uh, they definitely don't present a pretentious attitude as far as the wine is concerned. Hell, they call it old country. So maybe harken back to old world wines or wines you get from the countryside in Europe. No issues with that. I touched upon low sugar earlier, but let's review their RS numbers or how they, how, or how they measure them. They use a non-standard serving size of six ounces. While most restaurants do use this as their standard pour because it's, well, it's just easier to see in the bottle if you're at a quarter, a half, three quarters poured, the international standard is five ounces or 100 milliliters. How did I say international? The international standard, the international standard. Oh, okay, that was kind of weird. Anyway, they talk about their wines being less than 0 0.5 grams of sugar per glass. You know who else is that way? Just about the entire EU. All right, check this out. Here's the math. At a maximum of four grams per liter, a 150 milliliter glass will have 0 0.6 grams of sugar. At six ounces or 177 milliliters, that's 0 0.71 grams. That's not that much of a difference in my opinion. 
Remember all those U.S. wines that were four grams per liter or less? Yeah, the Grassi wines aren't some kind of unique low sugar wine. Hell, watch a lot of my reviews and see the wines that have the RS on their tech sheets. Most are under four grams per liter and many well below that. And they're from all over the world. By direct. Now, lots of wineries operate this way. It maximizes profit to not go through a distributor and then a retailer or a restaurant. And since they don't have an actual winery or tasting room, their overhead is lower. Well, not zero, since there is some kind of overhead for you know paying people to make, make the wine and shipping and boxing, storing, etc. They also talk about avoiding retail markups and expensive packaging. Right? So their implication that retail markups being high is kind of misleading since most retailers sell a wine for the same price a winery sells it for. Now, maybe a winery will sell for a couple dollars more or less, but the key for them here is they aren't cutting into their profit by putting it into distribution. I'm fine with that. Just don't make it seem like retailers are gouging the public. Markups are pretty standard throughout with some exceptions for iconic wines. You want markups? Go to a restaurant. That's where it's really expensive to drink alcohol, period. And really everything else. Remember, everything is really marked up higher in restaurants because that's how they have to make the money for paying for everybody. Expensive packaging is absolutely spot on. The packaging probably costs around $4 or maybe less given Aaron's background and his connections. A single bottle's packaging costs around $4 or less, sometimes more. So you're cutting the cost by 75% here. That leads us to the last part, better for the planet. Box wine is generally better in that it creates a lower carbon footprint than glass bottles. It's cheaper to make and also ship due to being much, much lighter. Granted, it's a plastic bag rather than glass, but you know, there's a trade-off here. I cover this in more detail in my interview with Jake Whitman from Really Good Box Wine, so check out that episode. All right, my initial shipment came with these two small glasses, bistro style, I guess, along with a, well, a deck of playing cards and some literature uh, talking about Pauline Sunday Sugo, your, your, your gravy. We, my family never called it gravy, but your, your pasta sauce. And talking about putting meatballs and pasta and this, all the stuff. And then on the other side, talking about how to make the sauce. That was a really cool touch, you know, trying to, again, the whole Roman thing, right? And the playing cards, you can see I actually didn't open them up, but I imagine they, they have this logo and all that. That's cool. Um, now you just get the boxes when you order them. And you can buy the glasses separately. I, I thought it was kind of gimmicky that you got all this, but I guess they decided that if people kept buying the two and three box sets, that they would have a plethora, a plethora of glasses and playing cards and well, really the same recipe over and over. Um, a couple more things before we get into the wines. They list ingredients. That's awesome. This is Washington grapes, yeast, minimal sulfites, quote, for packaging, for package stability. And um, that's it. Other than being required to mention sulfites, I'm glad they have a reasonable FAQ about sulfites. Though what minimal means is a mystery to me. Like RS, most dry wines don't have a crap ton of sulfites, though I guarantee you can find stuff that does have a lot of sulfites. And even if it did, sulfites are not the problem. Yes, I'll eventually have a show or two about them, like next year sometime. Maybe like the end of next year, I don't know. They also list things like calories, carbs, fat, protein. Well, all wine is zero for fat and protein. Calories come almost exclusively from alcohol and dry wines. Carbs are like 90 to 95% from RS, though there are some fibers in the wine that contribute to carbs. Technically, these fibers are more complex sugars, but we don't think of them like, like sugars. Anyway, uh, now that I've been hypercritical, it's time to give you the stats on both wines. All right, so the first one is the non-vintage Grazi Old Country Duo. Well, it's a red and white. Um, it's 88 bucks for a one-time purchase, including shipping and tax. That's for both boxes. There's actually a bonus. I would say that the actual retail is closer to 35 to $40 for each box. Okay, the white wine. It's from USA. Claimed AVAs, in other words, not on the box, but this is on the website, and there's no correlation with what grapes come from what AVAs. So you have 93% Horse Heaven Hills, 5% Waluke Slope, 2% Rattlesnake Hills, and then 0.1% Yakima Valley. Yeah, that adds up to 100.1%. All right, varieties. Website says varietals, but to be nitpicky, it's variety. I'm guilty of using both terms interchangeably, but I try not to. Guarantee you can find shows where I do that. 
Anyway, 86% Cabernet Sauvignon, I'm sorry, 86% Sauvignon Blanc, 13% uh, Chardonnay. They, they say naked or unoaked. This is poor labeling and confusing. No one ever labels a wine like this when listing varieties. You talk about the use of oak or lack of oak later. All right, 0.2% Viognier. That's it. Yeah, it's short 0.8%. I would say it's probably others. ABV, 13.24%. So it's actually not a very high ABV. That's where you're going to get your calories from. The RS is 0 .4, 0 0.14 grams per six ounce glass. That comes out to 0 0.79 grams per liter. That's actually really good. I've reviewed wines from plenty of places that have that much RS or around that much RS. Calories, about 120. Carbs, 0 0.14 grams, because that's from the RS. Fat, zero, protein, zero. Okay, the red, also from USA. Claimed AVAs, again, no correlation with what grapes come from what AVAs. 37% Rattlesnake Hills, 34% Waluke Slope, 25% Horse Heaven Hills, 4% Columbia Valley, uh, that added up to 100%. At least I don't have a note saying it didn't. Uh, varieties, 68% Cabernet Sauvignon, 20% Merlot, 8% Petit Syrah, 2% Syrah, and 0.3% Cabernet Franc. Yeah, we got the math issues again. We're missing 1.7%. I'd say it's probably others. ABV, 13.42%. The RS, 0 0.12 grams per 6-ounce glass, or 0.68 grams per liter. Calories, about 120. Carbs, again, 0.12 grams. Fat and protein, zero. All right, no, there is no mention of oak treatment, so I'll assume zero oak, or at least no oak barrels. Okay, let me just say this. I know all of this might be implying that I have a negative view of the wine before I even taste them. I'll do my best to be 100% objective. For all I know, the wine kicks ass. It is probably very tasty. I'm just less thrilled about the marketing. All right, so without further ado, let's get into the wines. All right, so if you watched my really good uh, box wine review or interview with, with uh, Jake, um, I talked about opening box wines. Pretty much every box wine is about the same. You have uh, this little, you know, little punch thing and pull this out. I didn't really show that on the other one. Pull this, pull this out. Throw it over there. And then we're going to try to find the, um, the spigot. This sometimes takes a, a, a minute. I mean, I see it. Now it's just getting it out to where it needs to pour. All righty. All right, so we got it out. And you can put the little thing back in there to help keep it going. All right, so uh, there's this little tab here. You're going to pull up on that and then pull it around. And now you've unlocked the little spigot. And then you're just going to pour it in here. All righty. Put the spigot that way. Okay, and let's let's get into it. So again, I'm really critical about the, the marketing of it. And look, I have no problem with wines really promoting that they have less than one gram per liter sugar. That means they fully fermented it. That's awesome. There are lots of wines out there, uh, definitely, that have more RS than others. But here's the deal. If you have four grams per liter or three or two grams per liter in your wine, you're doing it for balance. It helps make things taste better. Is it artificial? Is it fake? I don't know. I mean, old, old, old school wines never got to the, to the uh, alcohol levels we have now because native yeast, especially hundreds and thousands of years ago, weren't able to convert the sugar to 15% alcohol or 13 or 12. These wines were actually naturally sweet. They were much lower in alcohol. This is what they drank, okay? It's only in the last few hundred years that we've been able to, like, First of all, we figured out what yeast was, and then they were able to breed yeast to be more efficient with uh, consuming the sugar. So you get higher alcohol. And how do you make sure you have lower alcohol? Harvest earlier so that you have less uh, sugar at harvest so that you get a lower alcohol. You can, and they don't say this, I'm not saying they do it, 
you can have a higher bricks at harvest as the measure of sugar. And then you fully ferment it completely, like you with, with less than one gram per liter. And you could have ended up with a 15 and a half uh, percent alcohol wine. And then you can use um, various techniques to reduce the alcohol, okay? There's all kinds of tricks to do things. All right, so as far as color, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a good white wine color. Uh, it's a light straw color. I got a little bit of uh, gold on the side. Um, I almost said green, but literally I have the green of the green screen showing because I don't have any green stuff. Though there's maybe maybe this glass will look a little bit different. Normally I use the blue because a lot of times there's green in the, in the glass or green in on a label, but there's nothing green here. And then I'm recording my Halloween episode after this. And there's definitely no green in that that I know of. Anyway, very pleasant smell, uh, fairly aromatic. And I mean, it's, what we have, we had Chardonnay. I'm gonna go look at this real quick. V, uh, the Viognier, that's what I'm smelling. You know, it's only 0 0.2. Sauvignon Blanc, that's what it is. Yeah, it kind of, it kind of in, a, in a weird way, smells like a white Bordeaux, but you have the, the Sauvignon Blanc and the Chardonnay are playing nice with each other. The Viognier really isn't doing much. I mean, it's giving me some aromatic lift, which is a lot of a lot of reason why we, they use it in the Rhone. In, in uh, red Northern Rhone wines, the Viognier, it, uses, it gives you an aromatic lift. Also helps stabilize color, which is kind of weird that a white wine stabilizes color, but that's what they tell me. But anyway, uh, you have a combination of tropical fruits and citrus. I get a little banana. Um, I also get, um, I kind of feel like the, the, the little microphone is hitting up here when I look down, so that's why I keep tugging on my shirt. Yeah, like some orange, some pineapple, papaya, guava, more of that really tropical type of stuff. And that's probably coming from the, uh, the Sauvignon Blanc. Um, a touch of orange, so that's more likely from the, from the uh, Chardonnay. I thought I got like a little bit of a banana thing, which is kind of weird to get banana on a white wine. You usually get banana from a thing called carbonic maceration. Um, which is very popular in places like Beaujolais. And you get that, you can get banana and bubble gum out of that. But there is something like a Laffy Taffy thing going on here. Not unpleasant by any means, just kind of a little bit different. It does have a sweetness, a ripeness to the aroma. So it smells fairly ripe, but not like over the top ripe. So I would say that they probably did harvest this at a reasonable bricks level. If they had harvested at a really high bricks level and then reduced the alcohol by like one or 2%, the ripeness still should, still should come through. I said a little bit of floral and I detect zero oak on this, which is totally fine. That also helps keep your cost down, by the way. It tastes really good. So those flavors come through. It's not, it's not super ripe. It's kind of, it's almost old world-like. Like it has a bit of ripeness to it, but it finishes dry. And here's the thing, I, I've, had, I've had wines at this RS level and higher and they do finish dry, okay? But you would think, well, with like less than one gram per liter sugar, it's gonna be like bone dry or, or like dry out the mouth. It doesn't really finish that way. Um, I do feel the alcohol a little bit at the very, very back end, but it's not like I would say it's a high alcohol, it's medium. Um, but yeah, the, it's a richness of the fruit, especially the guava, the papaya, that type of stuff is really the prominent thing. Get a little of the, the citrus is orange. I also get a little bit of grapefruit. So Sauvignon Blanc is coming through again. Um, touch of floral, but all three of the grapes can, can produce florals. This Viognier tends to do the most floral stuff. Um, at 0.2%, for all I know, it was just like, it was extra. And they were like, hey, we got some Viognier, let's throw it in there. And, they, and it, it did enough of a change to the wine that they were like, yeah, let's keep it in there. Um, yeah, no oak, it's clean tasting. Um, very much like, you know, freshly sprayed down, um, like concrete type of thing. It tastes really good. All right, so here's the million dollar question. Is it worth $40 for a box? Okay, with the idea that, okay, so that's 10, that's four $10 bottles of wine. And in reality, because you're saving all this money, the equivalent quality should be closer to about $20, maybe a $30 bottle of wine. Does this match up to that? I say, yes, it does. It's a very good wine. I think it's well-made. I think it's excellent. Um, like I said, I figured that the wines will probably taste fine and be really good. It's just the whole low sugar thing. I just kind of 
kind of turns me off. But it tastes good. I'm definitely going to enjoy this wine. And it totally is not even close to being oxidized. Like when I first tasted this, um, you know what I should do? I still have the boxes off to the side. Let's see. And so July is when I did it. It's October right now. Let's see how, let's see how it pours. All right. So when you look at it, this is room temperature. It's, you don't see any oxidation on there. So let's, let's see, let's see. Maybe it was just going through a weird phase. Oh no, it's, it's totally like oxidized. Yeah. It's just like, ugh. so yeah, I'm not even going to taste it. Cause I don't want to have that in my mouth when I do the red wine, but no, this tastes really good. Let's go to the red wine. So far, so good, Grazie. I like the wines, and I think they're appropriately priced. I think what it is is I just think sometimes the the <clears throat> the marketing was a little cheesy, and I'm kind of like, really, but you know, I get it. It's a lifestyle. A life. They're, they're, these things are sometimes called lifestyle wines. Try to get it in the glass. All right, Ooh, it's pretty aromatic already. All right, kind of poured a little too much. On the color, it's a really deep uh, ruby color. Not a ton of staining on the glass, but it's it is present, but it's not a very not a lot not a lot. It's mostly opaque, uh, as it should be considering the varieties that are in there. Let's uh, let's have a smell. Snippy sniff, as, as Gary Vee used to say. Um, I mean, it's kind of a mishmash of red and black fruits. On the aroma, not exactly a fan so far of it yet, but I mean, that's it's the initial, it's the initial you know, evaluation of it. But it's very fruity. The fruit is ripe. Now things are starting, it's, it's airing out, so it's, it's getting a little bit better now. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you just need needs a little oxygen for things to just get better. Yeah. I'm, I like it better now, but yeah, it's loaded with, with really not super ripe, just ripe, like blackberry, raspberry type of thing. A little bit of plum, a bit of blueberry, but it's all the red and black fruits. There's a touch of earth, but not really. It's like a fresh earth, fresh potting soil. Um, none of the, none of the actual spices that you would get from an oak, from any oak barrels, or if they did any type of oak treatment, which would be like oak chips or um, dust or whatever. There's other ways to add the oak flavoring to things. So I don't really get that on the nose. I do get a, definitely some floral, I get some like violet. Yeah. I feel like I get a touch of green to this, which the Cabernet Sauvignon for sure can give us a little bit of green along with the Merlot and, and well, there's not much Cabernet Franc in there, but uh, Petit Syrah is going to be in here for color along with the Syrah. Let's just uh, go ahead and taste it. I say I like the white wine better. The red wine's solid. Like, if I was going to judge this on, on, on quality as far as like price point, um, yeah, 20 bucks maximum I would pay for a bottle of this. You know, 10 to $20. It's in the right price range. This one I think is for sure $20 at, at least. And you could probably get a couple more dollars out of it. This, I think, you know, if I, if you were asking me to pay 30 bucks for a bottle of this wine, I'd be like, nah, 20 bucks is fine. And here's the thing. And this is more of a personal preference. So that's probably why I'm kind of giving it a little bit of a, a ding as far as quality. There's a, a flavor of this wine, of red, of wines like this. And I've had lots of wines that taste very similar to this. Usually California, though, I've had them from other parts of the world. Um, including Washington. And it just, I don't know, there's something about it that's just, just not appealing to me. Now, that doesn't mean it's not appealing to you. Uh, actually, I know a lot of wines that taste sort of similar to this or have that certain type of flavor profile that are very popular, that people like it. It's just not my style. Um, there is a bit of bitterness to it, and that's not what it is. Um, Tan is actually really nice. It's not, not over the top. Like, you could kind of just sip on this, okay? 
And here's the thing, over time, I might like, I may drink some of this tomorrow or the next day or whatever, or let it sit in my glass for a while and it will open up and it'll change. So I've had wines do that. I'm like, in the first, even this one, I was kind of like, ah, and it was like, oh, I like it. And uh, even the aroma. Well, actually, that one I was pretty much from media. This one, the aroma at first, like, ah, uh, then I like the aroma better. But I'd say that, I hate to use the word generic, but it kind of tastes like a lot of other wines I've had in the same, you know, 10 to $20 range. So to me, it's not like, oh, this is something like totally different. The pluses are it's in a box wine. So it's actually decent quality. I think the white wine, in my opinion, is a better quality wine, uh, but it's a decent quality wine. So for 40 something bucks, 44 to $50, um, if it was retail. So you're figuring 10, 10 to 12 50 per bottle, right? Um, in reality, it should be a 20 to $30 bottle of wine. 20 bucks is about as much as I would pay for a bottle of this. I mean, it's fine. Um, it doesn't really inspire me to like, really like go back and drink a ton of it, but you know, I'm going to finish this because well, it's actually not oxidized and that's, that's the other good part. Yeah, it's okay. And that's, Hey, that's just my take on it. Like I said, there's a lot of people that will like this wine that will love this wine. All right. So what's my, what's my final evaluation of, of the wines? You know what? All things being said with the low sugar thing, which I, again, I'm not against low sugar. I just... I'm just against people trying to make it sound like their wine or the wines they sell are something special and unusual. And with that said, there are wines out there that have elevated amounts of sugar, but in reality, unless you're drinking Moscato or Riesling, you're really not drinking that much sugar as far as wine's concerned. Um, even at 10 grams per liter, you're only having a couple grams in a glass. Now, again, if you're trying to follow a keto diet, well, first of all, you shouldn't be drinking alcohol. At least not a lot of it. Um, so I know with keto, you're not supposed to, have, you're supposed to have less than a certain amount of grams of sugar. So even so, you're not supposed to drink more than one or two glasses of wine in a day anyway. So if you got four grams or five grams of sugar from two glasses of wine, not a big deal. But the reason I say you shouldn't be drinking alcohol if you're trying to stay keto, and especially if you're diabetic, is that alcohol screws up the regulation of glucose in your blood. It does, it makes your body, it regulates it differently, okay? So it's not just that it's low sugar, it's that alcohol does stuff to your, your body, changes how it, how it interacts with sugar, okay? I don't know if it's bad or good or both, or it just depends, but I know it, it kind of changes things. That's why they really suggest that diabetics don't drink a lot of alcohol, period, regardless of how sugary it is, but especially things like, Rum and Cokes, because the Coke is where all the sugar is, not where the rum, you know. Um, certain beers have a decent amount of sugar in it. You know, dessert wines, those have a lot of sugar in them. You add the alcohol in there, now, you're, now your body's all jacked up with, with sugar, okay, how it's, how it's regulating it. So, um, yeah, even something like, you know, a Camus that's at 10 grams per liter, if you have a couple glasses of it, it's not going to kill your diet. Just don't drink the whole bottle, like, every day, and then... And because also, also alcohol makes you eat more, especially sugary stuff and salty stuff. So that's, that's, that's the real problem with alcohol and diets is that it, it causes you to do things you wouldn't normally do if you're drinking a non-alcoholic beverage. Okay. Otherwise, as far as these wines concerned, I think I, I like the white a lot. The red is like, that's okay. I think they're, I think the value is there. I think the quality is there. Again, the red wine, I'm kind of like, it's not inspiring to me. Not that it has to be life-changing. This isn't life changing, but it, I like I like it a lot. But I think I think the quality's there. I think I think uh, if someone's buying it and they like how I describe the wines, that they'll like these wines. It's box wine. It'll last for you know at least six weeks after you open it. When you do get these wines, make sure you don't wait like eight nine months to open them, because especially because they're non vintage. Who knows how long it's been since they've actually uh, boxed them. Um, now, maybe things are different now because they're, they're boxing them. They're doing it all in Prosser instead of it shipping it to California. And who knows how long all that took. I mean, that doesn't take that long. But, you know, if there was a delay in things. But, um, yeah, I mean, as a category, I think box wine is awesome. I think you get some really great value out of it. Um, it's better for the planet in general. And I think you should check it out. Um, these are direct-to-consumer, which um, is fine. And the, the bonuses, you get free shipping. If shipping is included, think about it. Like... 
sometimes shipping in certain states is a lot more than, say, close you know, other states. Uh, and the tax. That is a great deal. To my opinion, that's a great deal. These boxes should have cost me, instead of $88 for the pair, should have cost me like $95 to $100 at the pricing I think they would be at. Okay? So um, take that for what you will, that the shipping and the tax is included. So in reality, I guess they're not $44 boxes. They're more like $35 boxes, you know, each. Okay? So again, we're still in that 10 ish dollar range, but it's still more than your $20 black box, right? And the quality is definitely better than your standard 15 to 20 ish dollar box one. Okay, so that's gonna do it for today's show. Uh, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends, and we'll see you next time. Maybe with some Grazie box wine. I don't know. Cheers. <laughs>